Good evening. My name is Dr. Carla Alcindor, and I am the senior director at our UST Max Center, which is the micro campus of University of St. Thomas, located in downtown Houston, but our micro campus is located here in downtown Conroe. So it's a pleasure to be here um, utilizing this beautiful space that Sacred Heart Parish so graciously makes available to us for our larger events. And boy, do we have a treat in store for us this evening. This is going to be a very, very special luminary lecture. So I'm so glad that you're all here. Um, I'd like to share with you the bio of our esteemed speaker so you'll have a, a, an idea of, of who's bringing this, this topic to us this evening. Dr. Dominic Aquila. He is the professor of history at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. He was also founding dean of the School of Arts and Sciences and served as provost and vice president for academic affairs and Dean of Graduate Studies from 2008 to 2017. Dr. Aquila has two doctoral degrees, one in Higher Education Administration from Texas Tech University and another in History from the University of South Africa. Aquila has an MBA from New York University and his bachelor's degree is in Music from the Juilliard School. <laughs> It gets better. <laughs> Among his publications are Dante's Purgatorio, A Liturgy of Forgiveness and Restoration, which was published in 2021, Music as a Liberal Art, The Poetry of the Universe in Religions, 2022, and Natality, A Human Action in Dante's Commedia, from the University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame in, uh, or Notre Dame in November of 2022. Aquila's most recent book is The Catholic Church and the Age of Enlightenment, The Challenge of Secularism, 1648 to 1848. <coughs> this semester, Dr. Aquila is teaching Dante as theologian for the University of St. Thomas's School of Theology at St. Mary's Seminary. And tonight, he will share with us how Dante's Divine Comedy is the perfect companion for Holy Week. Very timely subject. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dominic Aquila. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you. Well, thank, you um, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, and thank you to Caller for the invitation and all the work that she's done to establish uh, a presence for the University of St. Thomas here uh, in Conroe, which is a growing and exciting community. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to ask a uh, show of hands, uh, how many of you have read uh, Dante's uh, Divine Comedy? Uh, good. How much of, uh, if you don't mind me asking, did you read all three or just? Dante. Terrific. I read, uh, I didn't finish it, uh, and I, I, I had a crisis of something or other. <laughs> <laughs> you heard all three. I, I have to say that uh, to meet people who have read all three, because uh, those of you who are sort of new to the, uh, this uh, divine comedy, uh, it's rare that people read all three of the books. Uh, they start with Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Hell, purgatory, and paradise, right? Uh, usually, most people, you read just Inferno. They'll read it in college because it's, it's, an, it's kind of an exciting book. Uh, and uh, it, it's loads of drama. Uh, it's where you know, Dante uh, talks about what the punishments are for various sins. Uh, and I know when I was uh, an undergraduate reading it, we would always say, uh, you know, if only we had the opportunity to put this friend of ours in there, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I gave the, uh, um, the Italian government has established March 25th as Dante Day. They call it Dante Day. Uh, and they established in 2020 in the midst of the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, so they established it to, it's it kind of what, would bring Italy together. 
if not their, their poet, their poet laureate, their poet who actually organized and created a universal Italian language. So they, they established and they knew very well that nobody could go out to lectures at that point. Uh, so in uh, the United States, they, uh, uh, various parts, of, uh, uh, Italy has an ambassador here and various consul generals. So we have a consul general in Houston from Italy and they sponsored a lecture uh, to celebrate Dante Day, March 20th. I'll tell you why March 25th in a minute. So uh, I was invited to give the Dante Day lecture to the Houston community at the Italian Cultural Center in Houston. And so the, the Italian Consul General was there uh, and he was introducing me and a little bit about why they're celebrating this Dante Day now. So, you know, he, he was a younger man and he said, you know, uh, Nobody reads, everybody reads Inferno, fewer people read Purgatory, no one reads Paradiso because it's boring. <laughs> so I said, you know, that's what a setup for me because I'm going to be talking about all three and especially Paradiso. Uh, but it's true, uh, even in Italy, even in Italy, most students there will read maybe Inferno, a little bit of Purgatory, but people find Paradise uh, very difficult because they say well, it's very mystical, it doesn't have the, the drama, uh, uh, the kind of lurid drama that you would find in Inferno. So why March 25th? Well, March 25th in the year 1300. Now, scholars debate this, you know, in, interminably. Uh, we have, uh, Don, uh, the, the reason why they wanted to declare uh, March 25th, 2020, Dante Day is because that was 700 years uh, after the pub 700 years from the publication, uh, the first publication of the Divine Comedy. Dante, the, the author, the poet, died the following year, 2021. But it's uh, fairly well agreed, um, except for these little inside arguments with scholars that March 25th, 1300, was Holy Thursday. And that Dante, uh, as the pilgrim in the story, because we always want to distinguish between Dante, who is the poet author, and then Dante, who is actually the character in the Divine Comedy. He is, a, he is we call him Dante the Pilgrim. Uh, and so there's a distinction between Dante as poet and Dante the pilgrim. Now sometimes they merge uh, at very key points, both of them, because in a way, Dante the poet, when he writes this, uh, he, uh, he begins it in the year 1308. And in the year 1308, he had already been in exile from his beloved city of Florence. And uh, exile in those days uh, was pr pretty serious. It was that mm, one step less than death. Right? So, uh, because of Dante's political involvement in the city of Florence, which was always going back and forth between, in the outline that I handed there, uh, there are two political parties. Uh, so he's in exile because he was on the wrong side of a political contest. Uh, his family were associated with the party that was called the Guelphs. And the other party was called Ghibellines. Now the Guelphs were loyal to the papacy. The Ghibellines at that point were loyal to the Holy Roman Emperor. And so I don't want to get bogged down at all. It's, it's a very complex history of there. But just let it be said that Dante was on the wrong side, right? Uh, he, he was on the winning side for a while, but then um, his side, the Guelphs, uh, eventually were uh, his particular uh, a party of the Guelph, there were two black and white Guelphs, his party was uh, uh, overrun in Florence. So Dante was a political figure as well as a poet. So as a political figure, uh, he is, before he learns he's exiled, he was on um, a diplomatic uh, embassy from Florence to Rome. He had a mission, he was gonna represent the city of Florence uh, to the Pope. While he's in Rome, he gets this message that he can no longer return to Florence. 
uh, if he returns to Florence, uh, he will be burned at the stake. So <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, he had three, <laughs> so that's a good read. You know, and there's, uh, well, uh, if, I, if I have enough time and I get through it all, I'll tell you why that is such uh, a poignant uh, a moment for him. Uh, because as a young boy, uh, burn, burning at the stake, you know, we always think of burning at the stake as a, as a penalty for witchcraft. It was a common practice of execution, a terrible form of execution, but it was also a, a public event. It was meant to be a public event. So Dante, as a young boy growing up, and even as a, an adult, he would, um, he would witness this. And so he was very, uh, he would talk about the stench that would come from this. And it, it, it actually informs how he's writing uh, at moments in the Divine Comedy. So he's in exile. Uh, he can't go home. He has one or two of his children coming and visit him. He can't go home. His wife can't join him. So he is uh, essentially cut off. He has no salary from the Florentine government now. Uh, and he has to go around from one Italian court to another Italian court uh, doing, uh, writing poetry, uh, trying to make himself of use. Uh, it wasn't until he goes to the court of a man named Cangrande in Verona that he's able to settle in well enough that he can uh, turn his attention to writing this magnificent epic poem. Uh, he, and the other thing is Dante had sort of fiddled around with other kinds of work. He wrote some lyric love poetry. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, Vita Nuova about uh, a new life that he would begin as a poet. He wrote a book that was an imitation of Plato's Symposium, didn't work out. Uh, so he had all of these false starts, right? Uh, but then something clicks and he settles in to write this poem. Now, I, I have to tell you, I, each um, part, uh, the, the entire Divine Comedy is broken up into what are called cantos. A canto in Italian is a song, right? So uh, it's like a chapter. It's, it's something like a chapter, short, short chapter. I have read, and there are 100 of them from the beginning of Inferno to the end of Paradise. So for about the last 20, 25 years, I have been reading one of these cantos every single day. All right, so uh, I, if, if there was any kind of l poetry or, or uh, a story that I would want to live in, it's that story. All right, it's I, I'm so immersed. So I, it's just something I've devoted my my life to. I love this poem so much, uh, and often I think about the conditions that Dante wrote it. Right, he he was. By every, every standard, in thir by the time he starts in 138, this man is a failure. He's been exiled. He can't go home again. Uh, he's, he's made some starts in this project, at nothing. Then all of a sudden he sits down and this thing just flows out of him. Imagine that. So I, I'm reading this every single day of the last 25 years. And I stop and say, how could this be? How could a man write this? Because it has, it, you know, many of you, I'm sure, uh, read your scriptures at least daily or weekly, right? And when you read scripture, when you were, uh, say, 15 years old, and you read it at 20 years old, and then you read it at 40 years old, it's all different, isn't it, right? You bring something new. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that comes, that it constantly enriches you. I have the same experience with Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, as much as I've read it, there's always something that I see that's new. Uh, and it's, con uh, you know, the, Carla was good enough to mention some of the things I've written about Dante. Well, it might, I have learned to think even more deeply since I, I wrote these two years ago. So it's like, this guy, how did he do this, right? Um, why March 25th? Uh, he's in exile. March 25th is Holy Thursday. He begins the story. It, it opens up. It probably the most famous line in Italian. Nel mezzo di camme di nostra vita. 
halfway through the journey of our life, uh, I found myself in a dark wood. I didn't know how I got there. You know, and so this is, this is a moment, it's very poignant, right? That's his condition. You know, he's in a dark wood. He can't see, he can't figure out how he got there, and he can't get out. That's, his, that's a condition of exile. And he's imagining himself at that point in the same way as Christ abandoned on the cross, right? Uh, Christ abandoned. Uh, so he's writing this. Now, of course, he wrote it over the course from 1308 all the way to 1320. Right? So it, it took a long time to write it. But he's imagining this, all of the events in this story are happening from thir Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. He emerges out of Inferno on Easter morning, uh, and then he continues his journey all the way to Easter Thursday. So if uh, you had a mind to do this, uh, if anyone did, you could start reading this book next, next Thursday, one week from tonight. You could start reading it, and you could follow, and, and uh, I, Dante is very clear. He tells time mostly by the, uh, the stars, by astronomy, uh, you know, wh where certain constellations are. So if you uh, are geeky enough like me, you start to study this, and you can see exactly where he was in the story at any given moment because of the constellations he's referring to, right? So uh, this, is, this is why I entitled this, you know, A Perfect Companion uh, for Lent and Easter. And it, it is kind of, uh, it's, it's joyous in this way. Uh, if you read Inferno and you, you get out of Inferno, then you have, uh, when you're in purgatory, you are saved. Hmm? If you're in hell, no. But in purgatory, you are saved. You just have to work out. Your sins are forgiven, right? Um, and, but you have to purge yourself from the stain of the sin. Uh, in purgatory, your sins are forgiven, but there is still the inclination. That's, this is Catholic theology, and this is what Dante plays on. So the journey up Mount Purgatory is the purgation, not of sin, but of the inclination and the stains of sin. And then following purgatory, um, which is a climb up a mountain, then paradise is really an interplanetary journey. Because paradise, for uh, Dante, is, all, is soaring through the, the planets one at a time, and each of them represent a, a certain point in heaven. And then finally it ends with the beatific vision all the way in Canto 33 of paradise. So if you read all of this from Holy Thursday to Easter Thursday, um, it, it's a really interesting experience to do that because you're walking with Dante at the worst moments and then the joy of Easter is the joy of salvation, right? Okay, so a little bit about the, the story itself when he writes it. He didn't call it divine comedy. Uh, he just called it comedy, comedia. Uh, but when people began to read it, he, he, sent, uh, he sent a copy of it to his good friend uh, Boccaccio. Uh, Boccaccio, Petrarch, and Dante are the Holy Trinity uh, poets of Florence. Right? They're most celebrated. So he sends a copy of this to his friend Boccaccio. Uh, and the story goes, whether it's apocryphal or not, is that he says, no, 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 this is a divine comedy. But now, why would you call this story a comedy? Well, to be sure, there are moments in the story uh, that are really funny, that are deliberately made to be humorous, the way we understand comedy and humor. But he's also drawing on uh, the tradition uh, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks and Aristotle, that a comedy had a certain form, right? A comedy. Comedy begins in disorder and chaos. And then through the working out of the story, it ends in harmony, right? It ends 
uh, has a happy ending, right? Tragedy is the opposite, right? Tragedy begins with harmony or a settled condition, and then through the story, things unravel badly. So think of Hamlet. That's the classic one, right? So Hamlet is a tragedy. So Dante is calling it a comedy in, in, in using it in the sense that was classic, classically understood, that a comedy begins in chaos and disorder and ends in harmony. Okay, so that's, that's one uh, thing that you want to understand about the entire comedia. But then, and this is what gets, it's so brilliant, the content of the story, of the, the plot as he's going along, uh, is gripping, right? And it's, it's full of insights, insights that, you know, never stop delivering. But the structure of it, that is even more amazing. So on the outline, I gave you, uh, just look at the, uh, uh, the, the bottom of page one, uh, letter 3B. The imprint on, uh, the imprint on the Divine Comedy as a poem is the Holy Trinity. Everywhere are threes, all right? It start out, the Divine Comedy uh, is broken up into three big books. They're called Cantica. Uh, so Inferno is one, Purgatory is two, Paradise is three. Okay, so that's the first big division of three. But then you look at the division of uh, how many cantos or chapters there are in this entire Divine Comedy. Well, there are 100. Okay, say, okay, Aquila, that doesn't work, right? It's not three. But what, what, how you make it work is how I make it, uh, most of it work. Canto one of Inferno is like the overture to an opera, right? It, do, it doesn't count in the terms of the plot. <laughs> It's, it's the overture. The story really begins uh, beginning in Canto two of Inferno. Uh, but even that aside, if, if you just want to think about the number 100, uh, look at number six on the outline. Uh, 100 is the square of 10, which is the biblical number of perfection. It is also a number of integration, discipline, law, and wholeness. The phrase God said repeats 10 times through Genesis. His word is reflected in 10 commandments that symbolize the ultimate law for any person to live by. So, you know, the, the fact that there are 100, and then if you consider the first canto as an overture, then it works out. Uh, either way, right, there's still a, a, a numerical symbolism. And uh, Canto One, as an overture, Inferno has 34 of these chapters. So if you if hold aside one, you get 33. Ah, there's the number three again, right? Uh, 33 is how many years Christ lived on earth, right? Purgatory is a solid 33 cantos. No worry there. Paradise, 33. So there it is, that, that symbolism of the three. But it gets better. I feel like the, one of those late nights, of, but wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. Each canto is divided, is, is, is the rhyme scheme, or the, the way the structure of the poem is, uh, is in three lines, three lines, three lines, three lines. And in Italian, it's called terza rima. Three lines, right? Uh, but wait, <laughs> it's even better than that. Each line, uh, each of these three lines, terza rima, form a unit. They are made up of 33 syllables. Right. There's, there's, I mean, the, the, this is the trinity. You can't miss it. Uh, it's uh, um, then the, the, the numerical um, genius is. So there are 100 cantos, right? If you go to the exact middle of the poem, taking into account all 100. There's a spot that, in the middle, you wind up in the middle of purgatory. That's the action, the center of the poem, and it's, it's numbered Canto 17. And Canto 17, 
uh, it's the center, so it means it's the essence of the poem. What is it the essence of this poem? Love. There is a discourse that, uh, not Dante, but Dante's companion here is Virgil. Uh, and Virgil, in the middle of the poem, the exact middle, uh, tells this, uh, what, what, what is love? You know that song by Hathaway, What is Love? I can't stop thinking of the Saturday Night Live people going like this. You know? <laughs> so it's this course on love right in the middle. Why? Because love, in Dante's view, God is love, right? And love, it, he thinks about it not just as an affection of the heart. Uh, love is also, um, if I use a highfalutin word, it's a metaphysical reality in that we are attracted to things. Love means an attraction, right? So we are attracted to good things, uh, and, and that's basically the story that Virgil tells in the middle. So you, when you read this poem, it's the insights that we get from it from just the, the dramatic action, the beautiful poetry, the content of it, the plot, everything you learn, but then you realize it's all held together in this numerically perfect, balanced way. Now that's no, I mean, it's, I mean it was deliberate. One more thing. <laughs> okay, so you could read the entire Commedia from beginning to end, all 100. You can read it linearly, right? If next, all week, everybody next week, right? You're assigned to start it on Holy Thursday. You can also read it horizontally. That's how numerically uh, well-formed it is. So, and it doesn't work every single canto, but most of them. So, for example, if you read canto five in uh, Inferno, you can then read canto five in Purgatorio and canto five in Paradise, and you will see resonances. You will see references back and forth to the the other two, All right? So that's another form of unity uh, in the, if it keeps the whole thing together, all right? All right. Now, uh, Dante begins this. What is, uh, uh, what is the object of, uh, uh, or sort of the inspiration for this? It's, he met when he was very young, uh, like most families, his family, uh, Dante Alighieri, the Alighieri family, were invited to a birthday party, right? And so he goes along with his parents and goes to this other family. And there he sees uh, a young girl, his age, about nine years old. He was about nine. Uh, and he immediately falls in love with her. Uh, he, and it wasn't, there was anything, there was nothing untoward in this love. Um, he, she grows up, he grows up. Uh, Dante is betrothed, you know, weddings were arranged. Uh, he's married, he is betrothed to a woman named Gemma Donate. Uh, they get married, they have kids. Uh, but, you know, Beatrice is still on his mind. But not in the way you would think. It's, he begins to idealize her as the object of pure love. And uh, she, um, she dies young. Uh, he sees her one or two more times in his life, but she dies in her young 20s. And, uh, and it, you know, the, it's, it's, it was tragic for him. Uh, but again, there was nothing untoward about it. It was always this idealized love. This is important uh, because Beatrice, you know what it means? Beatrice, thrice blessed, three times blessed. You thought you were going to get away from threes. <laughs> three times blessed. All right, so when Dante uh, is in this terrible predicament of exile, you know, kind of thinking himself a failure, uh, and he begins to write this, and he uses Beatrice as this object. So the poem begins, uh, Canto run right from the beginning, is like, as I said, Halfway through the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood. Now, the, the confusion there of 
of, of our and I, right? It's I found myself, but halfway through the journey of our life. Almost every commentator, and there's been 700 years of commentary on Dante's Commedia, almost every commentator will say, that is deliberate. The I, I found myself in a dark wood, is, yeah, I, I did, I'm responsible, right? I'm responsible. But it's a common condition, our life. And he finds it this dark wood, he's in the wood, and he can see on a distant uh, mountain, he can see the sun. He can see the sun. So naturally, like any of us would do, we start making your way to the sun to get out of this, this terrible, dark, scary place. But as he tries to climb up this mountain to reach the sun, uh, he's blocked. And if you look on your outline, I gave you the three animals that block his way. A leopard, a lion, and a she-wolf. Uh, again, 700 years of commentary on these three animals. You find an enormous variety of what people think they are. I just gave here the ones that are most common. Uh, each of them represents some defect, right? Uh, the leopard uh, representing the flesh, incontinence, excessive animal appetite. Uh, the lion, bestial violence and pride. The she-wolf, avarice, fraud, treachery. And you can see in that chart there what I did is I showed you how Dante then organizes by the, it's three, by the way, right? Organizes the entire structure of Inferno according to these three animals, right? Uh, the top of hell, the middle hell, and the bottom of hell. Uh, so, it, again, the threes. All right, so Dante's trying to get up this mountain, and each of them, the animals block his way. And so he has to retreat down from the mountain, uh, and he's really at a loss now. He turns around, and at the bottom of the hill, he sees a figure kind of shadowy. He can't make out the figure, who it is. But as he approaches, he asks the person as if that person would know how to get out of here. And the person doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't answer him, but rather tells, identifies himself, but he doesn't identify himself right away. He identifies, and this is one of the, one of the articles I wrote, about uh, Dante's um, devotion to the idea of nat natality, of birth. That every birth is the hope that the world could change, right? There's a modern philosopher who developed this as a philosophy. Her name is Hannah Arendt. But the idea is that uh, birth, being born, is the chance for change in the world, every single person. So this person, the shadowy figure at the bottom of the mountain, uh, doesn't say who he is right away, but rather says, uh, tells the story of his birth and when he lived. Then it's, it's Dante who says, ah, you know, that moment of recognition, you are Virgil. And then he begins to, you know, just be exuberant with praise. You are my master. I learned everything from you. All of my style comes from what you did. And it's true. The, uh, the, the whole idea of journeying into the underworld, Inferno, comes from Virgil's epic poem, The Aeneid. So there's this moment of recognition. And then it's a, it's a very comical kind of dialogue. This is where comedy does come in. So Dante sees him, asks him how to get out. He doesn't, Virgil doesn't answer his question, doesn't even identify himself. And then Dante recognizes him. Uh, and then Virgil, after, you know, Dante heaps all this praise on him, says, well, why can't you get out? What's wrong? So almost making fun of him. It's like, why can't you get out of here, you know? And then Dante uh, sort of conf almost collapses at his feet and says, these three treacherous animals are blocking my way. And the last one is the worst, the she-wolf, right? Uh, and then the, the language is such that it's almost as if Dante is identifying his own sin, his own sinfulness, with the worst of these three, the she-wolf. The language there gets very tangled and ambiguous. Is the she-wolf different than Dante? 
Um, and then Virgil says, finally uh, tells him, look, you can't, you can't go up to get out. You have to go down to get out. You have to follow me through uh, Inferno. So that's pretty much where they leave it in Canto 1. Then Canto 2 starts, and this is, this is a, again, another marvelous little story. So Dante in Canto 2 says, uh, you know, at, at the end of Canto 2, says, okay, I'll, I'll follow you, I trust you, I, I admire you. Throughout the poem, he's calling him my father, my friend, my master, my counsel. He just, all through the poem until Virgil disappears, uh, he's all these terms of endearment that he uses for, uh, for Virgil. Uh, but in Canto 2, all of a sudden, Dante freezes up. Uh, and he remembers, for example, St. Paul, right? When St. Paul had the vision where he was lifted up to the seventh heaven, right? Um, or uh, Aeneas, who goes down into the underworld. Uh, and Dante is saying, you know, I, I'm not St. Paul. I'm not Aeneas. I, I'm not fit for this kind of a journey. Uh, Virgil calls him right out and, and smells the cowardice, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, don't make excuses. And then he tells him uh, in an indirect way, you don't know what it cost to get you to this point, to get you out of the dark wood. Because the dark wood is symbolizes a condition in life, right? It's, it's a metaphor. By the way, uh, bracket that for a minute. Uh, I have, uh, there are friends of mine, uh, uh, one of my friends wrote a book called How Dante Saved My Life. Uh, reading Dante, he was in a deep, deep depression. Uh, in 12-step programs sometimes, they will use this uh, metaphor of the dark wood in precisely this part of the poem uh, for the, the, uh, the condition of an addiction where you, 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 you can't get out, right? You can't find a way out. And the way out, you have to rely someone else to pull you out, right? So this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a metaphor for a state of life, no? So in Canto II, after, you know, Dante is, is sort of chickening out, Virgil says, look what had to happen. Let me tell you what happened. Beatrice, his friend, right, uh, uh, has sort of been watching Dante from heaven. That's where she is. She's watching over him and sees how bad things have gotten for him. And she prays for him. We get to know all this in, in the Paradiso. So she's, um, uh, she makes an intervention. And what happens is there is this kind of high, uh, you know, chain of command of heavenly women who make this uh, intervention for Dante. Beatrice goes to St. Lucy. I'm not sure, nobody is sure exactly, but many, there's much speculation of why it's St. Lucy. You know, St. Lucy is the patron saint of the eyes, no? Um, and then um, St. Lucy goes to the Blessed Mother. And the Blessed Mother gives the order right, to, to, back, to back down the chain of command uh, and sends uh, Beatrice, gives her the okay, to go into Inferno, and take Virgil out of the place he's there. Now, poor Virgil, this is one of the great contradictions. Nobody can figure this out. Uh, why is Virgil in hell? Well, he's not really in the hell where you suffer these terrible torments, but he's what's it called a kind of anti-hell, before hell. Uh, some theologians call it limbo. Uh, it's, it's the circle of the noble pagans. All right, so uh, there you will find uh, uh, Virgil and Plato and Aristotle and Homer. Uh, you know, it's, it's the gang of great poets and leaders uh, uh, and philosophers. So uh, Beatrice gets sent down into this level and she goes to Virgil and she charges him with this mission. And that, so in Canto II of Inferno, Dante is, uh, Virgil is telling Dante this story. You can't chicken out. Look at, you know, we, we really had to move heaven to get this intervention for you. So, you know, steal yourself up and let's go. 
uh, and then they proceed down. But that little moment there of, of hesitation, you know, uh, and so they proceed into Inferno and they, uh, they go through the, the limbo that I just spoke of. Uh, and then that famous line uh, he sees over the gates of hell proper. Abandon hope all ye who enter here. Right? It's a, play, it's a pit of despair. Abandon hope all ye who enter here. I can't tell you in the tradition of Italian opera, Italian poetry, Italian literature, how many people to pick up on that trope? Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. So he goes in there. The first sinner he encounters uh, is, uh, and by, by the way, uh, as it, he, the deeper you go in this journey into hell, inferno, the worse the sins are. So at the first ring is the, the ring of hell where those who uh, suffer from lust are positioned. The next one, those who suffer from gluttony. And the next one, uh, uh, envy, uh, wrath, envy. And so you don't get into the serious. Now, what, what, what makes these other sins other than these? These are sins of incontinence, right? They, these are the sins where you can't control your animal appetites. The, the deeper you go, the sins are the sins of the intellect. They're sins of reason. Because for Dante, like all of you know, classical thinkers, uh, he was very much influenced by St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you know, reason is the, is the gift to humans, right? This is, this is our highest feature, uh, the ability to reason, to think. So if you deliberately turn this gift because everything else you share with the animals. But if you turn this gift into a nefarious purpose, well, that is a higher, greater sin, deserving greater punishment, deeper in hell than the sins at the top. Now, don't get me wrong. If, you saw, if you're in hell for lust, you're still in hell, right? It's just, you're, you're, you're not all the way down in the depths. But let me tell you a little bit about the first sinner he meets, because it's very important, and it sort of sets the model for uh, how he addresses sinners throughout. So as Dante, Dante and Virgil now are traveling together, uh, J Virgil is the guide, and uh, Virgil has to explain everything to Dante of what he's seeing. And it's often the case that in each level of hell, Dante will talk to one of the sinners there, or maybe a few of them. Uh, and so there are many, many people who are suffering in this particular place in hell, whatever it is, but one comes forward or two come forward to speak with him. And he gets to understand their conditions, uh, why they're there. They get to question him. Now, uh, so the first sinner he meets in the circle of the lustful uh, is a woman named Francesca de Rimini. Uh, now, if, you, if there was such a thing as like People Magazine back in 1300, what she did would be all over the press, right? Uh, it was a story of, and there are different kinds, you know, different versions of the story, but the essence is this. Uh, Francesca uh, was from Rimini, and uh, as I said, back then, marriages were arranged. So she was courted by a very handsome man from another uh, uh, city, city-state in, in northern. By the way, at this point, Italy is not, our nation, right, in the 1300s, 1400s, Italy doesn't become unified until 1864. So it's really, uh, Italy is kind of a cultural expression. That's why Dante is so important, because he unifies the language, uh, <laughs> unifies it. He, he's, the language of the Florentines will be the language of Italy, <laughs> because the dialects in Italy are so vastly different. But he gave Italy a kind of unifying language. Uh, so anyway, this very handsome man, uh, a knight, comes to woo Francesca. Uh, it, it's a good political marriage. And so she goes and she follows him to his city, uh, only to find out that it's not him that she's going to marry, but his brother, who is ugly and deformed and mean. So she, gets, she has to marry the brother. Uh, meanwhile, 
she has a heart for this man, his name is Paolo. Uh, the story goes on. Uh, the husband, who is mean, nasty, and ugly, goes off on an adventure. Uh, Paolo is left at home with Francesca, uh, and, they're in a, and they're in a condition where they're reading together. And what are they reading? Dante is so brilliant here. They're reading a romance novel <laughs> of the story of Guinevere and Lancelot. <laughs> right? Yeah, right? You wonder what's going to happen? So, and the way Dante, I, I, I have to, uh, it's, it's worth it. Um, <laughs> I haven't memorized this, this yet. All right. So when he comes, uh, the, well, this is the background of the story. Uh, he comes to meet Francesca. Uh, she wants, they, they're doing something they shouldn't do. Uh, the book falls out of their hands that day. Uh, and she said, then that day we read no more. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, the husband comes home. He sees them, and he kills them both. Right? So both of them now are in the circle of the lustful. And so Dante recognized, so in the punishment of the circle of the lustful is uh, people there are swirled around in a wind that is, uh, uh, never stops, right? And they, they can't control, they can't land, they s swirl around. Why? Because uh, these are all the punishments in hell, and the, uh, even the punishments in, uh, the punishments in, in purgatory are not meant to be um, uh, real punishments of, of suffering and revenge, but rather uh, suffering of, of purgation. Nonetheless, what Dante has created is called contrapasso. That is, whatever it is uh, that you suffered in your life, you get a double in hell, right? So if you couldn't control your animal passions, if you couldn't control uh, your sexuality, uh, then you are going to be thrown around like you know, leaves in the wind. You can't control. So that's your punishment forever. You can't control your movements. You're blown around by the winds. So Dante comes down and he sees all these people from history uh, who w fell into this category. Uh, and he sees Francesca. And uh, a Virgil, Virgil says, well, call her over here. She'll come. And so she comes over and she's going to have an audience with Dante. And she thinks that Dante came all this way just to see her. <laughs> it's like, I will give you an audience. And, uh, and then she begins to tell the story that I just told you. Uh, but this is a very uh, a key moment. This is kind of a little operatic aria. Uh, it, it, the Italian is, is, is gorgeous, but this is what she says. Uh, when she's telling a story, uh, it wasn't me, <laughs> you know? It's like, nobody in hell is responsible for what they do. So who is responsible? And she says, it was love that made me do it. Love that flames soonest in the gentle heart seized him for that sweet body which was snatched from me and how it happened, still he's referring to Paolo. By the way, Francesca and Paolo are tied together uh, back to back and for eternity, right? So they can't even look at each other. Uh, she never even names him in this whole story. She never says Paolo, she says in the Tari Kalu, we hit him, him, right, yeah, him. That's, it. That's all you get. And then she said, love that allows no loved one not to love, seize me with such a strong delight in him that as you see it will not leave me yet. Love led us to one death. The realm of Cain waits for the man who quenched us of our lives. Okay, so this is a, a thrice repeated little aria, amor, amor, amor begins. It wasn't me, it was love that did this. And uh, so Dante, by the way, um, each of these poem, each of these lines, uh, each time she says love, each of the lines that go with it are from the lyric love poetry of the time. Now one of the lines is Dante's own when he was in the business of lyrical poetry. 
in a sense, what he begins, because after he hears the story, uh, uh, you know, he collapses. He just faints. He swoons and faints. And he wakes up, and he's now in another. He doesn't even know he got to the next level. Now, why the swoon and the fainting? Well, again, it's much, the, uh, much speculation about it. One reason could be uh, he was so moved by the, you know, the tragedy of this story that he literally just fainted. He so sympathized with, uh, with Francesca, right? That this is what happened to her. How could it happen? And he, out of sympathy with her, just collapses. Another version, one I prefer, is that um, when she quotes back his poetry to him, he begins to realize that this romantic love poetry, which became very erotic, you know, uh, it became uh, that he was, could have been part of the cause for her being in hell. And so, he, you know, he's partly responsible for it. And so that's another reason why he swoons and falls, right? So uh, that's, uh, that's the first center he encounters. And it becomes kind of a, uh, a template or a model for all of the sinners he meets. One of the things, uh, and they're, they're going to be different. They're going to be men. They're gonna, um, there's no more women that he meets. It's all men that he meets. But one of the things that you see throughout Inferno is that w when he's talking uh, to people who are paired together, uh, the pe like Francesca and Paolo, they are together, right, in a, in a kind of physical way. They're wrapped together. They have no real community. They're back to back. She doesn't even recognize him by name. Uh, the next uh, encounter he has deeper in hell is with uh, a character called uh, Farinata. And this is uh, everything in hell is um, a parody of heaven. All right, so when he gets to the circle where the heretics are punished, he meets this man named Farinata. And as he's passing by the tomb, the grave of Farinata, this man Farinata bolts up out of the grave. And it's like he, he, is, he, he, he scorns hell. He's so prideful that he even scorns hell. This man cannot be humbled. And the way Dante describes it, you know, bolting up out of the tomb, well, what is that a parody of? The resurrection, right? And so uh, it's, and you can see this everywhere throughout, and I'll give you the final one in a minute. And, and the, him too, Farinata is buried with someone uh, who just happened to be the father of Dante's best friend, a man named Guido Cavalcante. Uh, and Farinata, literally, you could see the way it's described. Farinata is in the grave. He bolts up. And behind him, almost like with his head over the, the side of the grave, uh, and he's in, making ing Farinata doesn't even recognize that this man is there. So they're buried together for eternity. But they don't even recognize each other. Right? One more example of this, because what I'm trying to, what this demonstrates is uh, Inferno is a place of radical isolation of one human being from another. That even when they are bound together in some sort of physical way, they have no real communion. But the last one, the last uh, address to a pair, comes near the very bottom of Inferno. Uh, it's another one of these horrid stories. It comes from real life. Uh, the man is, uh, uh, the figure is named Ruggiero, uh, 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 well, one of them is Archbishop Ruggiero, and the other man is named Ugolino. Don't worry about the names. So uh, throughout their lives, Ug Ugolino and the Archbishop Ruggieri were bitter enemies. Mm. And they had this, sometimes they had a pact for a peace for a while, but most of the time they were at each other's throats. Uh, Ruggeri winds up uh, putting Ugolino in the in a tower and locks the door. In the room with him in the tower are all of Ugolino's kids. 
And he, what uh, Ruggiero does is basically starve them to death over a period of time. And there's this very ambiguous point in this story. Is the, uh, the, the says, Father, the son says to the father, Ugolino, Father, you gave me this flesh and now you are hungry. <coughs> and so the insinuation is a kind of cannibalism, right? That you would eat your own children. Well, that her happens right near the end, in Canto 30, uh, 32 of, uh, of Inferno. What is that a parody of? The Eucharist, right? Uh, the Eucharist is the most sublime offering of you know, the Savior's body and blood. This is absolute cannibalism. Uh, at the very bottom of hell. And so what is the, uh, it, the real cannibalism is, is certainly the suggestion that Ugolino might or might not have eaten his own children. But when Dante finds Ugolino, he finds him munching on the skull of uh, uh, Archbishop Ruggiero for eternity, right? <laughs> And, and Dante's description, and I think this is one of the reasons why most people uh, will read Inferno. Uh, it's because it's like, look, it's like going to a horror movie, right? It's like, after a while, you say, how much worse can it get? And so you're at the very bottom in this last episode, and you're witnessing cannibalism of the worst kind, with implications even worse than what Dante sees Ugolino doing, eating the bishop's skull. But then at the very bottom, all right, you, you have to meet the grand master of all this. It's Satan. Dante's Satan is the most dull character you can imagine. So Dante works his way into the bottom of hell, and there he sees Satan. Huge figure, right? With big, you know, flapping wings. But Satan is encased in ice up to his waist. Hell is not a place of fire. It's a place of ice. And uh, what is Satan doing? He has three heads. What is that a parody of? The Trinity, right? Uh, so he has the three heads. And in each one of the heads, he's chewing. The center head is chewing on Judas. Uh, one head is on Cassius, one is on Brutus. Right? So Dante is always mixing classical and Christian Jewish uh, imagery. He does that throughout. Uh, so Judas, Cassius, and Brutus. And for eternity, I mean, the, uh, uh, the metaphor here is that you have this dumb Satan. He doesn't say a word. If any of you might have read Paradise Lost by Milton, uh, there, the devil is a most interesting character. It's a devil who is conniving. He calls conferences with the other devils. They figure out how they're going to retake heaven. Uh, the, the, Milton's devil is, uh, is a man uh, of, of great interest, right? Not, not Dante, Satan. Satan is dumb. He doesn't say a word. He can't move. The only movement he has are these wings that move and his chewing of these three uh, characters from history. Now, when the, here's another parody. Uh, as he's flapping the wings, the wind from his flapping blows over the ice and sends this chill air throughout in the bottom of Inferno. What is that a parody of? The Holy Spirit, right? You know, a mighty wind, right? He's flapping these wings. So uh, here uh, Dante uh, is showing not only just parody of divine things, but it's uh, the opposite of love in this way. For Dante, uh, the way he'll explain it in Purgatorio, love is an attraction. Love is the pursuit of the good. Love is movement. And it's movement towards a good end. God is love. God moves to create the universe, right? His word creates the universe. Well, Satan can't move 
But the only movement he has is unproductive. Right? He flaps his wings, but he can't fly. He's chewing, and those people he's chewing on uh, cannot be dissolved. They cannot be digested. They're there, and, and every once in a while, Satan will flay these three characters. So this is the opposite, the exact opposite of love as a movement towards something that's good and true and beautiful. But Dante, uh, now this is the big test. So in order to get out of Inferno, Virgil and Dante have to climb up Satan's body. All right? Uh, can you imagine that? I mean, touching this evil. And, it, and the, way it's, the way it's described makes you, like I said, it gets worse and worse and worse. But as they climb up uh, Satan's body, they find out they flip the world upside down. And so they come out uh, where they, uh, they recognize that now Satan was actually um, looking down, right? It was actually inverted. Uh, and they, they climb up and they find themselves on the shores of Mount Purgatory. And so they're out of it. And it's Easter morning, about 5 a.m. Right. So that is, uh, and they come out and they see the light. They see the stars. Can you imagine, I mean, it, you know, so they've been in there for all, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and they come out to see the light on Easter Sunday. Uh, one more thing. How, what is the geography of Inferno? Uh, well, the, uh, the story is, is that, um, and the way the medieval world uh, thought about physical geography was, there was a northern hemisphere and then a southern hemisphere that was unpopulated. And so the story was, is that when the war of the angels occurred in heaven and uh, Lucifer, Satan, was thrown out of heaven, that when he fell, it wasn't that his impact created this crater, but rather the earth itself receded, didn't want to receive him, right? It wasn't the impact, but the earth received. So as he goes into this and, and pushes out all of the ground and the earth from the bottom, uh, creates Mount Purgatory. <laughs> so the, the, the earth that was displaced by Satan's fall creates Mount Purgatory. So, um, let me conclude with, uh, I, I'm hoping I give you enough that you want to read this all, all yourself. Uh, but there, there's one more uh, comical story uh, in the beginning of, of uh, Purgatory. So they come out, at, uh, find the light, they're just over the moon with joy. Uh, and then this old man comes along and says, what are you doing here? You know, how did you get here? Did you come up out of Inferno? And he starts castigating them. Uh, he said, did something in the laws of the universe change? No one's supposed to get out of there. Who, you know, basically, I didn't get the email. You know, how did things change? The figure is Cato. It's Cato the Elder. Uh, and if you know your Roman history, uh, Cato committed suicide rather than live under the dictatorship of Caesar. So he said, wait a minute. We just went to Inferno. There is a place in Inferno for those who commit suicide. The wood of the suicide, it's called. The first person they meet is a man who committed suicide. Uh, and he's in purgatory. He made it. Poor Virgil, who Dante loves and has been his guide, calls him his father, his friend, he's in hell. So this is the first, as I put on the outline, the first major contradiction. And you say, wow, wow how could this happen? You know, you can say, okay, uh, Cato, and this is the way most people read it sympathetically, Cato died for freedom, right? He, did, he didn't want to live under the tyranny of a Caesar. And so he took his life for the cause of freedom. But this is a, the Dante's encounter. Dante doesn't say a word to Cato. Virgil basically says to Dante, I'll take care of this. He's one of my own, <laughs> right? It's kind of a very Italian thing because, you know, he sort of puts his arm around Virgil. He doesn't really do it, but, you know, you can imagine, put his arm around Cato and said, look, let me, let me tell you. Uh, and, and he does, in effect, try to uh, pull an Italian thing. I know somebody. 
and the person he knows, uh, Cato was married to a woman named Marcia, and he was deeply devoted to her. And she was a runaround. Uh, she, uh, she asked uh, Cato for a divorce. He granted her a divorce. Uh, then she came back. He took her back. And so this was the, you know, the, the love of his life. So Virgil knows this, and he says, Virgil basically says to Cato, look, uh, I, Marcia's down with me, right? Uh, I will tell her you send her your best regards, you know, all, you know, all, of, all of this to kind of uh, uh, assuage uh, uh, Cato's anger. But Cato sort of pulls back and said, that doesn't matter to me anymore. I don't need your flattery. If you tell me the Blessed Mother is the one responsible for all this, that's good enough for me. And so uh, that's, uh, that's the, now the image that, Cato, that Dante draws of Cato is this old man with a beard, and the beard is, is divided into two and hanging on his chest. Michelangelo took that image uh, for his uh, Moses. Uh, if, you, if you see the Moses with the beard that's split, uh, that, that's the image from Cato. Uh, there's one more point, and then uh, I, I have to stop. Uh, in, in, in Canto II of, of, of Purgatorio, uh, Dante and Virgil see this ship. Uh, it's, it's really a skiff that is coming over the water right at them. And it's moving at an incredible speed, no oars. And it's, it's basically run by an angel. And on the ship are all the souls <clears throat> who were lined up at the shores in Rome uh, and waiting for transport to Mount Purgatory to begin their purgation. Uh, so what, they, what Dante hears, they're, they're chanting. They're chanting one of the Psalms, uh, and the Psalm is when Israel left Egypt. That's important because the entire, just as hell, was this radical isolation of one human being from another. Even isolation ones from yourself. The wood of the suicides, People's souls and bodies are split, and they will be that way even when the resurrection comes. So, uh, purgatory is actually the rehabilitation of soul of, of human beings. Right? It's the rebuilding from the ground up, and the way Dante is designed for this rebuilding, this rehabilitation, is he takes the model of the Benedictine monastery. That is. It's a, the entire pur purgatory is liturgical. It's uh, e almost every single canto of 33 cantos in purgatory, there's either a hymn or a Gregorian chant. Uh, it's, it's liturgical. And it's all, this is the way, a disciplined, ordered life uh, according to the hours of the day. Of course, purgatory is a temporal place. And that's how you rebuild your life. That is how you... Get rid of the stain of sin. Uh, and so that's the first encounter. I see these, one more story, because I love this one too. Uh, so the first person that gets off the skiff on Mount Purgatory, and it's, it, it, they, they look around, they see Dante and Virgil standing on the shore, and they figure they must know what's what, which way to go. And so um, they say, could you tell us you know, how we... Uh, how we climb this mountain, because the mountain is right there before them. And Virgil says, look, we just got here too, you know, like a few minutes before you did. We don't know anything more than you do. And then all of a sudden, Dante sees a friend of his, uh, whose name is Casella. Now, Casella was a, fa a famous musician at this, so it underscores the importance of uh, the liturgy of, of purgatory. And so Dante, uh, Dante is always so happy when he sees his friends who he thought were lost, that he sees them there as saved. And so he tries to embrace Casella, but you know, his, because Casella is just a spirit, his arms come back to him. But Dante says to him, my friend, uh, if your powers have not been lost or if there's some law against it, could you basically sing me a song, <laughs> right? And Casella chooses to sing a song to the lyrics that Dante wrote. And uh, everybody's enraptured by this song, and they're all gathered around. And who comes along? Cato, this tough old man, and says, scatters them. You fools, what are you doing? You're standing there listening to music. You've got work to do. You've got to get up this mountain. 
And what Dante is juxtaposing there is the beauty of music which can entrance any aesthetic, any aesthetic experience can entrance you and that's so you forget what you really need to be doing. So it's the juxtaposition of uh, beauty and ethics, right? That the need to do the right thing to get this purgation going. Okay, so that's the last story. Uh, you have to read the rest yourself. <laughs> but I hope I've given you a... Uh, yeah.